The COVID-19 pandemic changed our lives. It has reshaped the way we use technology every day, from the way we work and learn and how we access services. I'm Belinda Esterhammer and I'm a tech strategist. The Heinrich Bell Foundation in Hong Kong invited me to explore what digital life looks like today. There is no business as usual. Let's check out what is the new normal in social impact tech. The new normal would be, in two words, shared economy. Basically, every one of us, be however small we think we are, can be the next influencer in the social impact field. Technology allows us to make a small idea in the beginning to spread it out to however big it can be, as long as it's a good idea. It will definitely be digitization and decentralization. Whether it's digitization of classes, of people's time and efforts into credits and reward systems, and also decentralized decision making and crowdfunding. It's soon going to be um, essential uh, to the sustainability or growth of any company that they incorporate an element of social responsibility and social impact into that business. I think that consumers are becoming more and more aware and conscious and with that, they're asking a lot of questions with things like what's in their products, what are their products made of. One thing that people were not looking at that much when the social impact thing started rising a couple years back was sustainability. And not in the sense of that industry sustainability, but financial sustainability of a social impact company. It's nice to do good, but you want to do good for long. The new normal for the sustainability industry is urgency. We have no more time to waste. There is a report that just came out that said that we are 60 years delayed from meeting the UN SDG 2030 goals. We don't have time. I want to explore how these innovators contribute to fight the pandemic. Let's take a closer look at their stories. I'm Cynthia Nunish. I'm the Chief of Strategy and Growth at Dream Impact. Hi, I'm Dorothy Lam, the co-founder and chief catalyst of Dream Impact. We are an impact resource bridging platform, helping social startups grow and scale both their impact and business. And how we do that is that we help them with our four core pillars, um, with our space, our co-working and event space, our impact community building, um, our corporate partnerships, and also finally our impact investing arm. So helping them match with the right resources that they need, whether it's on space, on community, on people, on partnerships with corporates and also in, with investors. Um, and we really envision um, a society where everyone is conscious of the work they do, the things they buy and the values they advocate. Um, in order to achieve that world, um, we as Dream Impact want to drive um, a purpose-driven ecosystem. So all the four pillars and all the people that we've engaged, as I mentioned, it creates this ecosystem where they can help each other and build um, upon each other's work and they share the same values. Social impact has become such a buzzword. Can you please tell us what you define as social impact? I would say look at impact first. That means you have negative or positive impact. Everything that you do today, whether it's the plastic you use, the clothing that you buy, the food that you eat, has an impact, whether it's positive or negative, on the environment and people around you. And the social part meaning that you're relating to beyond your personal life. So how it's affecting your relationship with your family, your friends, your community, city, country and globally. So then looking at the two words together meaning that you have this effect, positive or negative, on a larger scale to think beyond yourself. How did the level of collaboration change when COVID-19 spread across the world? We were able to work with our other partners to also put together a community resilience fund. And that fund was really a bridging loan for our startups um, in this time of difficulty, especially facing um, cash flow issues where the clients were not paying them on time, the um, existing invoices were delayed into the future, um, they don't really have um, other ways of income, but they have, a, they have a pivot plan that they could then use this bridging loan to develop. Impact investing is not just always looking at capital that look for a financial return, but new ways of structuring capital that can actually help um, a certain social issue at that specific moment in time. How do you see the future for social impact startups in the next two years? 
we'll definitely foresee that there will be more cross setters and collaborations and a growth with um, impact. So I think you know the word social impact venture may become more vague because actually more businesses, even corporates, will look into the impact angle and how they could actually grow within their business strategies uh, with other people, with other community partners, as well as with other social impact ventures. So we definitely see that the ecosystem will be growing alongside with more sectors, more industries, and even more partners within the game. We really also see technology playing a greater role, but not technology just in the deep tech side, but also in technology and communications, technology and improving their operations. So that can really help improve their impact and spread it more across different sectors. Did this pandemic made us more social? I think this pandemic really helped people rethink about health and their relationship to themselves and to their family. Um, a lot of them were trapped with their kids, um, you know, and having to educate um, homeschool in a long time and really thought, okay, wow, teachers are being paid very little. Like they, this is actually a really important role that they should play. Um, and so that's really a, an awareness raised on education, um, awareness raised on health. Thirdly, on the environmental impact, really seeing how you know this is causing a lot of deaths, but also all the plastic waste that's been coming, and how this pandemic is also potentially really a result of climate change and how everything is interconnected. So I think this was a great wake-up call for the whole world to really be to think more socially. And I think, you know, besides the physical restrictions that we all have to bear with for this amount of time, um, this is really showing us that, you know, human to human connections are, are very close. So we've never actually felt that there was a restriction as to the social bonding we've had with our friends and family. So in fact, you know, the physical distance is actually not really the social distance. We do feel that, you know, we're ever more engaged with all of our partners and our friends. And so I think, you know, a lot of people would start to see how interconnected we are with, you know, the, uh, the people to people connections with our society and also the climate. So I think you know people are really starting to see those connections and those bonds and threats within the community and, and definitely that would help um, spearhead the growth of impact um, of the communities and also the ventures. What is technology for good? Technology for Good is looking at a social issue that impacts a lot of people and looking at how technology can come in at a lower cost, more efficient way to solve the same problem. A lot of the times when we say technology and why technology is for the scale, right, for scalability. So I think that's also a question that we want to raise is what is it and what's the purpose of scale? So is it for the sake of traction? Is it for the sake of financial growth? Is that really doing any good or a lot of good for the humanity? Um, so I think, you know, that is a lot of the, this question is actually in our mind time and time again, every single day. Um, when we were saying that growth, growth could mean other things. It doesn't have to be financial or just, um, you know, monetary. It could also be social value. It could be say how many people we're reaching with this really good tool to actually improve people's lives. So we are talking about a more blended value approach approach here and, and how we could um, actually accelerate the growth of social value as well as you know monetary value that would improve people's lives for the better, for real. Why should we question technology? I think we definitely should question technology because it could go both ways, positive or negative, and it would have a detrimental effect if it's going to the negative end because talking about scale, technology brings scale. So if it goes negative, it would actually negatively impact a lot of people. My name is Nicholas and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Outside Tech. So Outside is a hyper-local community app that connects users to help their neighbours and businesses with operations and daily errands. Yep, so you can imagine it as something like a Pokemon Go for errands, whereby you can see pins on the map that um, shows you things that people need help with, you can interact with it and help your neighbours with their tasks. So can you please tell us more about your app and what changed for your company when COVID-19 spread across the world? Um, what we did was we actually cut our platform fees and made it free to use for most of our users. Um, and that, that actually got us um, to spike in terms of number of users when Singapore went into circuit breaker, which is something like a lockdown. We, we need to launch something like online category because um, daily errands were getting limited. As a business, we still have to find a way to survive and sustain ourselves. And uh, we actually got endorsed by the government at that point. And yeah, it really helped us quite a bit during that period. And 
we are still sticking to our focus of trying to connect people to help each other. So how do you see the future um, of what people need or the tasks they will post in the next one to two years? So currently we are actually uh, looking at collaborating with MNCs and SMEs to actually create shift-based job opportunities for our community. So this means that users will be able to pick up maybe like a 1 to 5 p.m. job, get paid five hours for being at like, you know, the supermarket or working at a convenience store. So really just trying to create ways whereby they can earn money and make a living within our platform. What are your predictions for the social impact industry post-COVID? I, I think especially during these times that people are being segregated and people are afraid of being near each other, the idea of social impact is even stronger. Uh, along with the impact of how technology has advanced rapidly during this period whereby businesses with their legacy systems have also been disrupted to allow for remote working. Yeah, I, I do think that larger conglomerates and businesses will be more open to collaborating with social impact startups and putting some money into like improving these platforms or utilizing some of these functions. So I think the future is looking pretty good for social impact. What do you think makes Asia so special when it comes to social impact? The, the things that are different here is the fact that we have so many languages in this whole region, right? It's really tough for businesses to like just jump between borders and to try and, you know, bring their services abroad. So I think this increased the amount of collaborations and partnerships across countries. And it's pretty sweet to see like things like that. My name is Sonali Figueres, and I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Green Queen Media. So I run Green Queen Media. I'm the founder and also the editor-in-chief, which means I'm responsible for all our content. And we call ourselves an impact media. And what does that mean? It means our agenda is to change minds and change behaviors. So we cover everything to do with the most pressing issues of our time, from climate crisis to sustainability to eco-fashion and, of course, alternative proteins and the future of food. So what are some of the trends that you're seeing in Asia that this pandemic uh, created or accelerated? What I'm really happy about is the biggest thing that's changed is that people have made the connection between what's on our plate and the future of our planet and humanity. I think there's a big link between the pandemic and our broken food system. And in Asia, um, those were very separate issues and now they have really been connected. So I see a big change in people's attitude towards uh, making uh, concerted efforts in their daily life to choose better for the planet and for global health. Can you please elaborate more on this broken food system and how technology is actually helping? It's never been a more exciting time to get into food. And what food tech is, it's, it's a new industry that has come out um, because entrepreneurs within that industry are looking to solve major issues in our global food system. So here are some of our issues. We depend way too much on animals. Billions and billions of animals are part of our food system. The price of food is artificially cheap for various reasons, but also including a ton of government subsidies and food industry lobbying. Um, we have a food system that is so reliant on animal protein that it is actually impacting our climate crisis. Um, something like 18% of the carbon emissions in the world are due to eating animals. So that involves animals, uh, meat, and also dairy. Um, what doesn't get talked about as much, but is equally as important, is obviously um, we, are, we have almost no more fish in the sea, and we rely way too much on fish for, for protein. Basically, what's happening is that in Asia, our populations are growing, and um, we have a huge amount of, of, of economic mobility. So in countries like India, Indonesia, Malaysia, and China, huge amounts of people, hundreds of millions of people are going from, you know, not having had a chance to have education and um, financial stability to being middle class and upper middle class. And when people become middle class and upper middle class, they tend to want to eat more meat because that's the model that, you know, the global um, food system is based on. And the problem is, if everyone in China and everyone in India starts eating as much meat as we eat in Europe and the US, we literally cannot support the human food system. We do not have enough resources. So when it comes to sustainability tech, are there any areas where Asia is a pioneer? 
One of the biggest issues in sustainability, whether it's in the food system or for example, the fashion system, is traceability. Do we know where this product was made, how it was made, who made it? And so I see fantastic applications for blockchain in that area. Also, what, what people want is they want to know that they're, what they're buying is safe, right? We have a lot of food scandals across the world and especially in Asia. And so technology is definitely going to help with that. So are there any examples of food tech startups and companies here in Hong Kong? We are extremely lucky. Hong Kong is a pioneering place for the food technology industry. Green Monday started out as a social movement to get people to quit um, meat and, and dairy on Mondays. And then eventually it, it, it birthed Green Common, um, which is the first kind of Asian chain of delis and restaurants that serves plant-based products and foods. And then it also birthed Omni Foods, which is their food tech arm, and which is the, the arm which produced the award-winning Omni Pork, the first uh, commercially available alternative to minced pork. And so that is all right here from Hong Kong. What are some small steps that each of us can do towards a more sustainable life? The most important thing you can do first is just consume less, buy less stuff. I always say to people, can you go one month without buying anything other than food. When it comes to food, however, my number one rule would be, can you reduce meat, dairy, and seafood? Can you just focus a lot more on plant-based proteins, mushrooms, pulses, legumes, nuts, seeds? I'm not saying give it up completely. I'm just saying make it more of a once in a while than an everyday, three times a day kind of uh, world. The other thing I would say is, can you become part of a more circular, um, economy mindset, which would be kind of, you know, um, not so much on the single use items, uh, trying to buy secondhand as much as possible, renting rather than buying. And the great news is, is that we have so much innovation and so many new companies and platforms that are helping you live a life that way. Does COVID-19 have an impact on our climate crisis? And can you please tell us more about that? Um, I think COVID-19 is happening because of the climate crisis. Um, we have damaged our environment. We have raised millions of hectares from rainforests and jungles, which has meant that wild animals no longer have a place to live, which has meant that they've had to live in urban environments closer to cities, which is not where they should be, which means that they've been able to interact with human beings and livestock, which is how diseases have spread that shouldn't have spread. So there is a connection already, just baseline. So what are your predictions for the sustainability industry post COVID-19 in Asia and around the globe? I think there's going to be a huge impact um, on, on our food systems. I think that's going to be one of our biggest um, areas of, of opportunity. And I think a lot of people have now made that connection between sustainability and the food system and what and, and started to understand that we need more investment, more entrepreneurs, more ideas, more companies, more distribution channels to really change how we eat. Sustainability has now become a sort of a must have rather than a nice to have. And so with that is going to come a lot of greenwashing and sort of people jumping on the trend, but not necessarily really having those values embedded deep within their business model. My name is Shahani Rasapatra and I'm the founder of Just Goodness CEO. So Just Goodness CEO is an e-commerce site. We sell natural, sustainable and eco-friendly alternatives to everyday products. Uh, we are focused on empowering and supporting companies that have a lack of resources and funding. Can you please tell us more about what has changed for your company after COVID-19 spread around the world? In terms of responsibility, we're in a place now where all of the SMEs that we work with, or a lot of them are depending solely on us to keep them moving in terms of revenue throughout the month. Um, so that's a lot of responsibility that's fallen on the team. Uh, during this time also, you know, we had to really think a lot about our supply chain, which completely broke down during this time. So Just Goodness was still able to operate um, despite a government lockdown and a curfew. Can you please tell us more about that and how did you make it happen? There were government trucks, you know, circulating in all neighborhoods, but there were still homes that didn't get their essential needs. 
So what they decided to do was give, um, they identified a few services that were listed as essential services and they allowed us to have passes so that we could distribute products that people needed during time. Did you see a change in buying behaviour after COVID-19 spread across Sri Lanka? There has now been an import ban that has been put in Sri Lanka. So people um, are now pushed really more into buying locally, which I think is a good thing. Um, obviously, all of the SMEs are benefiting from it, the local economy is benefiting from it. So with that, uh, people are now exploring what the country has to offer of itself. So it's been good in that sense. How are you empowering non-tech and low communities to sell the products online? A lot of the SMEs that we work with um, operate offline. Uh, one of the things that Just Goodness does is we're able to take these companies and put them online so that they can uh, you know, reach a much bigger market both locally and now with the Just Goodness global platform also internationally. Sustainability is one of Just Goodness's um, main pillars and you're based in Sri Lanka, the 25th most polluted country in the world. Can you tell us more about how you help um, finding a solution and how you're being more sustainable? First of all, we prioritize companies um, that value sustainability. Uh, that's extremely important to us. So even when we're vetting companies, we also vet them for where they stand in how their business practices are sustainable. Uh, where possible, when it comes to food items, we try and buy in bulk. So we um, kind of cut out the individually uh, wrapped plastic products. Apart from that, we also do things uh, where we encourage our suppliers to send us uh, our stock basically using public transport so we can combat our carbon footprint. Um, a few other things that we do is we have a plastic free uh, home line that we distribute to uh, the local supermarket chain so that even if a customer is not comfortable purchasing online, they still have access to plastic free um, home goods. I'm Vincent, the co founder of HeartChat. Hotchet is all about matchmaking, connecting the dots together. We focus on the mental health and personal development field, connecting those who can provide service in the mental health and personal development field to those in need of such service. So we matchmake a lot, a range of professionals, including clinical psychologists, including social workers, counselors of different uh, disciplines, um, and therapists, and also different sort of coaches. So all of them are accredited, licensed, specialized in a certain field. As for the end users, they have a wide range of demands, ranging from uh, uh, workplace relationships to romantic relationships to personal development. Can you please tell us more about what you define as social impact? I think um, social impact to us or to HeartChat is more about community building. Because as you may be aware, HeartChat is not a profit-making um, initiative. It is actually not non-profit at all. So everything we do, we just care about sustainability and that's it. So um, what we're trying to do essentially is to create, to group uh, like-minded individuals together. So we try to form a community and, and by creating the shared value, that is actually the biggest impact that we can create. So how is mental health affecting Hong Kong's population? So in Hong Kong alone, more than 70% of the people interviewed actually suffer from PTSD symptoms due to COVID and due to political uncertainties in the past. Also, one in six people in Hong Kong are actually having a feeling mentally unwell from, uh, from such, uh, from such a, an episode. Why are we living here? We're not here to work. We're here to be human beings. We're not human doers. We're human beings, right? So what COVID has done to us in the past year is that it actually separates us from other people. And communication, interaction with other human beings is one of the biggest sources of happiness. So I think it is something detrimental to us, both in terms of our uh, productivity and also our ha intrinsic, genuine happiness. And that's something we really have to deal with and to talk about, either online, either physically, in whatever format. What are some of the most common challenges that people face nowadays when it comes to mental health? Two things. First of all, stigmatization. It is hard enough 
to have mental issues. It is even harder to have people judging you, stigmatizing you, isolating you when, wherever, whenever you go. I think these stigmatization, isolation, completely unnecessary. It is there because people don't understand mental health or mental well-being. Do you think that this pandemic made us more social? No, because I really like human interaction. With COVID, most of us are very now very, very um, used to talking um, through Zoom or through um, Teams, etc. So it is becoming less and less of a problem for people to actually not go out, just stay in the room, and they can still connect to every single one in the world. But then, human is all about forming real connections, and real connection and important elements are actually real life communication. Um, involving touch, involving smell, involving different sort of interactions. So I think um, the challenge ahead is, that, is to actually find a balance. So technology can actually allow us to be accessible to anyone within seconds. But then how can we become the most intrinsic, most genuine human without being sort of carried away by this technology? I think it's a challenge to all of us. Thank you for watching. Look out for our other videos on technology trends on health, travel and education tech.